And I'm gonna hit the other chord button. Five, four, three, two, one. Welcome to America F1, where we're going to review the Brazilian Grand Prix of 2024. Was this the best race of the season? I don't know. I kind of like the British Grand Prix, but this was right up there. If it wasn't your favorite, it has to be your second favorite. There's so much to talk about in this Grand Prix. We're not going to even start with some type of introduction. We're just going to get right into it here at America F1. Yeah, America F1. America F1. It's a golden run. America F1. Oh, it's simply lovely. That's right. It's simply lovely with our friend Scott from Experience XO. Scott, was this super max with the knockout punch? Is the championship over for Lando Norris? Well, I mean, oh, yeah, I mean, it's absolutely over. I mean, he now has just a, a massive lead. I mean, if he wins Las Vegas, he wins in Las Vegas, he gets the championship. I mean, this was the race where he broke the back of Lance's championship bid, which, as you know, from our prior shows, I said was never really a bit anyway, but he showed the world who the best driver is on the F1 grid, whether you're his fan or not his fan. Uh, there is no more talented driver on the grid right now than Maximilian Verstappen. I mean, he made them all look like amateurs. I mean, it was what, 20 seconds he put uh, at the finishing at the finish line. 20 seconds, I think, was his lead. And then it was fastest lap after fastest lap after fastest. I think it was 17, something crazy like that. Crazy. No DRS. No, DRS. Yeah. Uh, no tire strategy. Just pure speed. You know, look, when Max, it reminds me of when Max raced Brazil as a teenager in the Red Bull in 2016. Mm. And did it then, too, as a kid. He charged through the field. He has an ability to race in the rain that few people have. He just, he balances the car in a way that no one else does. He doesn't, he's not hard on the brakes. He's not hard on the tires. He just knows how to balance the car in the turns in a way that nobody else does. When they teach you in racing school, you know, to go, to go fast, you have to perfectly balance the car in the turns. And he does it in a way that nobody else does. It really looked like Max was driving F1. And everybody else was driving F3. That's yeah. how it he, he looked great out there. I mean, and they had a new engine in that car, and it was a rocket ship. I mean, it looked really fast. And not only that, going 17th, there's not too many people in F1 history who've gone from 17th to first place. And the other ones were uh, Rubens Barrichello did it from 18th to 1st in 2000 at the German Grand Prix. We got Kimi Raikkonen. He did a 17th to 1st in 2020. No, 2005 at the Japanese Grand Prix. There's this guy, and I, I never even actually heard of this guy, John Watson. So he did it twice. He did it from 22nd to 1st in the 1983 United States Grand Prix and 17th to 1st in the Detroit Grand Prix in 1982. Now, I never even heard of this guy, but I'm going to have to look him up. And didn't, didn't that's some uh, pretty uh, up there names. It's, it, it's an amazing result. The thing about it, though, is because we were in the rain, that really erased the advantage of Max's new engine. The rain is the great equalizer. This is why you had the Alpines with the worst engine in Formula One, about 40 horsepower less than the others. There they are, um, coming in second and third. I mean, you had Pierre Gasly going from, I believe it was uh, starting in the P13. Yeah, uh, which I think is just a, uh, that's a big story too. I mean, the Alpine, he's going from 13th to third, and everyone's talking about what a generational drive from Max for Verstappen, which it was, but... Let's give it up for Pierre. I mean, that was a great drive from Pierre, too, because Ocon only went from fourth to second. Okay. But Pierre went from 13th to third. Yeah. Ocon was strong the whole weekend. Ocon has always been really good in the rain. If we remember, his one race victory was in Hungary when Valtteri went bowling for Red Bulls. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, 
Yeah, that was something. And then Lewis, unfortunately, started on the wets and everyone else pitted. That was a bizarre race. And then Mando defended Lewis like a lion, and sort of kept Lewis at bay and let really Ocon get that buffer to win. And But Ocon has always been really good in the rain, and he was good all weekend. Um, but the Alpines definitely were the other huge story. I mean, talk about a Cinderella story. Oh, wow. Sort of like, you know, started from the bottom, now we're here. Like, drink, right? Started from the bottom, now we're here. I, I mean, mean where did they go? From ninth in the constructors to sixth, 33 points in the weekend? I mean, it's wow. 30, it's a $30 million weekend, potentially. Uh, they are now, I believe, yeah, they are 49 points. Uh, so three points ahead of Haas. Right. Uh, um, and and the Haas is two points ahead of V Carb. So there is now a fierce battle on for P6 because there's literally five points separate three teams. But Alpine literally went from nothing to something. Although, in all honesty, once we're back on dry tracks, especially a power track like Vegas, which races just like Monza, I mm-hmm. think that's going to continue. That's going to be it for them. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, uh, talking about Alpine, that's Pierre Gasly's fifth podium and that's Esteban Ocon's fourth podium and they both each have one win and we know that Gasly is going to stay with Alpine and Ocon's going on to Haas next year yep. which is you know here's what and I, I mean I love the, the their story if you didn't know it these guys have been racing since their child children like i you know Esteban and Pierre have been racing since they were in go-karts. So they've known each other for a very long time and they've had some contentious. I mean, I'm not going to say the rumors were, but the facts are they didn't like each other. They don't like each other. You know, they're not, they're not friends. They, they're serious rivals. And I don't know what, if it came back from karting or their F3 days, but whatever it is, they're not friends. But what I did like, is after the race, they were talking about, you know, when they were growing up and racing in the wet and being the only ones out there karting in the wet and in the snow. And it, it brought them back and they actually like were holding each other. And so even though they have this contention between each other, it was lovely to see that, you know, this victory for this team brought them together and they could share a moment with us, the fans and everyone watching. The thing about for them is they're so I mean not not stature wise because one is pretty short one's pretty tall but they're so similar they both come from Normandy France neither one is super wealthy they were their competition their whole life from the time not when they were in senior karting like 13 14 but from the time when they were five they were racing each other and they were the ones standing in the way of each other's success wow and I think I have a clip of them talking really quick let's see what they have to say yeah Come here, guys. <laughs> what a shot! What a shot, uh, guys! What a tremendous uh, job you did today. Yeah. You remember in Anvil when we were driving on the rain? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Even on the snow. We were driving the snow. on the snow, on the rain. <laughs> was it like that today? Yes. Pretty much. Pretty <laughs> much. Yeah. The same. Same as it was. I love. I love that. I mean, they were just hugging each other. Because they didn't expect it. And we didn't expect it. If you would have gave me and said, hey, I'll bet you a house. You put you put up your house. I put up 10 bucks or no, 100 bucks. I wouldn't have taken it. If you would have said Alpine double podium, I'll put up my house. You only put up 100 bucks. I would have just said, "Nah, I'm not giving you 100 bucks because there's no way that's going to happen. But here we are. Look, I love the story of the Alpine drivers because they're not the children of F1 drivers. They're not the children of billionaires. They're basically middle class, the lower middle class kids who scratched and bit and did everything they could to get to F1. And one of the reasons that they don't get along is because they both have that story of struggle and they both want to keep their Mm -hmm. seat, their job so much because they had to work so hard to get there that they're so similar that now that they're parting ways, now they're looking back on it and they're realizing that they actually had so much in common all those years. And so it's best that they're sort of on different teams. Yes. But I think that they're looking back on it a little more fondly than when they're competing against each other. But, you know, look, um, both of them funny are, too, because they are from humble backgrounds. 
they're two of the nicest drivers to fans and everyone watching, if you ever get to approach them um, at a race, at a hotel, both of them will stop for you. They will talk to you. They will actually engage you. They will sign things. Neither one is too good for that because neither one has a chip on their shoulder. Right. Um, yeah, that's beautiful. That's Did you saw what a juxtaposition with Max Verstappen in qualifying and what he had to say about quality because he had some choice words and here he is. Yeah, I find it unbelievable. I mean, the car goes into the wall, broken, it's clearly destroyed, but they wait 30, 40 seconds so everyone else can just complete their lap times. And uh, of course, the, the ones behind cannot even do a lap. I can't get my head around it. How that is possible to just let it go for 30 seconds, 40 seconds. And that, that of course, we're in qualifying. We are already limited with the pits because we're on the back. So when you do the restart time, you have to wait until you go out. So we are always in the back. But then it's, it really blows my mind. It blows his mind. And it blew his mind so much that he went out there and he beat the pants off everybody. Yeah, I mean, he wasn't wrong about why did it take so long to call a red flag. I mean, I, you know, it was a stroll. The car went right into the walls, totally destroyed. It wasn't going anywhere. <clears throat> he tried to get it going. But when you go into the wall at speed, your car is not in a condition to go back to the pits. Yeah, they probably should have called. You know, they, they should have had the safety car out right away. They should have called it right away, neutralized the race or the red flag. Right. He actually was right. As far as the car... Or Red Bull being in the back of the pit lane. That's also the case at Circuit of the Americas. It just depends on the track. Some tracks, uh, the P1 team is in the front of the pit lane, and some is in the back of the pit lane. There's no conspiracy. Right. But, yes, I do agree. Uh, usually red flags are called much faster than that one was, and I don't know why. Uh, he was right about that. But whatever the case is, I think he took every ounce of rage that he had over the last five since China rage of having a slow car, and he said to the world, I'm still the fastest driver on the grid, and I'm going to show it to you because now whatever problems my car had are gone because it's raining. <laughs> yeah, so. I mean, he, he proved it. Now, what do you think about Lando Norris? And it seems like Lando has a lot of sour grapes. I don't really understand what his deal is, but here he is talking about saying that Max Verstappen's win was lucky? It shouldn't have been red flagged, uh, but obviously that was the crash in the end which caused the red, so just that's life sometimes. Um, you take a gamble, it's paid off for them. Um, it's not talent or, you know, it's just luck. So, um, just... He's saying it's just luck. I mean, oh. wait, you know, I don't understand Lando. You know, I think he's becoming his own worst enemy because when he gives these interviews there's a lot of hater raid like there's some great mem <laughs> there's some great memes look at this one uh, it's a total hater raid like so he's saying that max for stepping it was just luck not you know not talent and then back when uh oh. Vettel was racing he said that maybe he should focus more on driving and then obviously he says well about lewis well it's easy to do that when you have the fastest car i mean he seems like quite the hater and then somebody else came out with this one they called me 007 zero w <laughs> dc wins zero poles to wins and seven lap one fumbles <laughs> that's a good one and then oh. last but not least they have this other one showing that Lando's championship hopes are over. And it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a train destroying a school bus. And look, what do you got to say, Scott? I mean, it's, it's over for the guy. Look, the most telling thing is when you go on the McLaren fan boards, which I have never seen, mm -hmm. they were turning on him and getting behind Oscar. And Oscar was no great shakes this weekend. He was, yeah. he did okay. I mean, he, he did good in the sprint, but he was anonymous yeah. in the quali and in the Grand Prix again. Uh, you know, he was, I think he started eighth. I think he finished eighth. Um, yeah. But people are, he's just saying a lot of things that people don't like, and, you know, and really just not displaying a championship level quality and a championship level attitude. Look, nobody <clears throat> uh, caused him to lose P1 except himself. He had a bad start. George Russell, good starter. And, Blew him away at the start. 
Uh, no one caused him, uh, I believe it was on the restart, to go off track and lose like five or six places. And as far as Max goes, he would have won the race anyway, uh, you know, safety car or not. He already was up at the front. And he was up at the front because he was lapping every, he was lapping like a second a lap faster than everybody else because he was passing people left and right. How he get put seven or eight cars on the first lap alone. Whereas Lando, you know, lost like what, three or four positions on the first lap. I mean, sorry, but the story of Lando's race is going backward. And that's not bad luck. That's lack of talent. Sorry. I, 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 I agree. You know, I saw a couple people say one guy who's a big, uh, Max fan, he wrote, oh, well, what's the difference between Max's uh, race in Brazil and then Lewis's in 2021? And then everybody said competition. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, well, Lewis was going against you. You're going against Lando. <laughs> and, and I mean, I, I'd hate to laugh because we, we all forget that this year is Lando's this is the first year that he's won a race like he's won his three races this year but before this year he had never won before so it's hard to expect a guy who just won his first race in this year to be championship material he's in the championship fight but he didn't really know how to handle it. Neither, neither did McLaren. McLaren didn't know really what to do in the beginning. I mean, because they remember when they didn't switch positions. I mean, if Lando was on his game, that could have cost him the championship. So neither one of them were ready. Neither one. Well, I mean, the pit wall and race operations and strategy at McLaren <clears throat> look a bit like Ferrari 2022. Mm -hmm. uh, not the pit stops. They're not as bad. But the strategy and the communications with drivers is Ferrari 2022 22 level. It's amateur hour. They don't know what they're doing. They don't have a plan. And they, yeah, they, they almost made another big mistake in the sprint race by not swapping positions. The second that Lando and Oscar had a one second gap uh, to Max, I believe it was, um, you know, they had the buffer. Uh, mm -hmm. Or was it to Charles? I forget. Um, uh, you know, they had the buffer. That's when you switch. When you have that one second sprint race, right? The yeah, they had the buffer. And didn't Max? Wait, wait. They had the buffer. Ch Charles was coming up, and <laughs> he was yeah. right behind Lando. And I thought they were going to make the switch a little earlier when they had a bigger gap. And I was like, oh man, if they do it, if they don't, if he doesn't get a little gap going, uh, you know, to Charles, shoot, he'll. <laughs> he Oscar might slow down, and then Charles might pass both of them up on that straight. So it was, it's just kind of like ah, like right. you say, why didn't you do it earlier? Like you knew it was going to happen. So what are you waiting for? I don't understand McLaren's strategy. I, I just don't get it. I, it's, it's, it's an area where they need tremendous improvement. Um, <clears throat> you know, it just looks like amateur hour over there. Um, as far as that, look, they're they've got a fast car. Maybe Lando will mature. Um, <clears throat> you know, this is the first year when he was sort of tested as right. something other than an upper midfield driver. Um, mm -hmm. We'll see. Um, <clears throat> we'll also have to see how Oscar does. Oscar has been having awesome European seasons. And then when he leaves Europe and goes to the flyaway races, he's been pretty quiet this year, and he was last year too. Well, is that to because he hasn't driven these tracks as much as the uh, tracks in Europe? Uh, that is true. He didn't train on these tracks. Um, mm -hmm. He hasn't been impressing quite as much, although certainly in the sprint race, he was quite good in the, in the drive. He was definitely the class of the field in that race. Yeah. Uh, didn't not so much in the grand prix, obviously. Um, but we'll have to see. Oscar has definitely the last three races, just not been in the grand prix, really putting in the kind of point showing that they need. Um, we'll have to see what happens in uh, Vegas. Um, although, Let's take the time to say and remember everybody out there to like, subscribe, and hit the bell notification so you can be notified when we have a new episode up. And I, all the people out there on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Podcasts, and Spotify, remember to tell your friends. You can also leave a comment now on Spotify so we actually answer your comments. We don't have a bot. It's got it's myself and when paul comes back it's himself so please take the time 
to give us a comment. We will respond. Now, Scott, I got a couple of things that I saw from the internet, and this is a new thing that we're doing where mm -hmm. we're talking about comments that come from the internet, and we're just kind of not only highlighting them, but we're talking about and making it a part of the show. This one's about Charles. Charles Leclerc got a bigger fine for saying fuck mm -hmm. than Mercedes did for breaching a technical directive. Now, what happened with Mercedes is apparently mm -hmm. it was the air in the tires. Yep. They, they changed the air in the tires when they couldn't. They know that. They knew better. What do they do? And they did it to both cars. They didn't do it just to one. What's, um, what's going on at Mercedes, Scott? Why, why would you do that? I don't know. I mean, Mercedes is having an anonymous season. They are in purgatory and fourth. <laughs> they're not going up to third. And they're certainly not with Aston Martin going back to fifth. They are in no man's land this season. They've got Lewis, who is looking forward to Christmas. Lewis cannot wait to get out uh -oh. of. Mercedes in the worst way imaginable, the worst way possible. He's now this falling. Lewis said, this is from Stephanie. Uh, Stephanie uh, does a blog, and she does a lot of Lewis and Mercedes content on Twitter. And she says, Lewis Hamilton said that the end of the season can't come soon enough, yep. and his expectations going into the remaining races are low. This is in quotes. I just put my focus on something else. I'm not fighting for the championship. It doesn't really matter where we finish in the championship. I don't care if I finish ahead of George or behind George. It really doesn't make that big a difference to me. I just want to keep the car out of the wall, try to score some points if I can for the team. And if I can finish well, then they if I'll finish well if they give me a car that I that doesn't bounce around and almost bounce me off the track in the next few races, then hopefully we can get a better result. Otherwise, I'm looking forward to Christmas. He's looking forward to Ferrari. I mean, I think he's just fed up. I think he, you know, I know he has intimated that he's been sabotaged by the team in quality, that, the, you know, that the temperature of the tires is, is, is too low, that he's not getting the same parts, that the car never feels the same in quality as it does in practices. Mm -hmm. and that he's not getting, he's obviously he's not getting prioritized because he's the departing driver. You know, one thing that he said, and one thing on the graphic, and we all know that Lewis is really good in the wet. I mean, that's what he won the British Grand Prix in the wet. I mean, he, he's won countless races in the wet, and he has one of the all time greatest drives up when he was a rookie at the British Grand Prix when he won by like 30 seconds or something mm -hmm. crazy. That's right. He was laughing at everybody. So he, he is good in the wet. There is a delta on, uh, in sector one, where George is two seconds faster in sector one than Lewis was in the wet. Now, we all know that to be almost an impossibility, but they were driving the same cars this weekend. There's just no doubt about it. George was on the old spa spec, and Lewis is driving like <laughs> this is also from the internet. It's going unnoticed and under the radar. It's now the third year of the ground effect era. No team is still doing this every weekend except Mercedes. It's embarrassing to say you're still experimenting after this long. They need to drop some of their dead wood staff and start hiring from elsewhere. Whoa. I have told you Mercedes has the worst aero department of the top teams in F1. They have the best engine, the best PU group, and the worst aero group, and I stand by that. Their aero department sucks it's a joke it's an embarrassment it's holding the team back the irony is that when they go to the 2026 rigs it won't matter so much because they dramatically decrease the downforce in 2026 by like what 40 percent and it's all about the pu so believe it or not those rigs are going to help mercedes and are going to mask the fact that their are department sucks <laughs> Gasly went from p13 to p3 why isn't that hailed as an impressive master class in the rain Oh, I, I mentioned that earlier. He, that that should be, right? I mean, that that was a great drive. Uh, moving on, let's talk about. We talked about Mercedes and how they're having problems. And I just want to point out to you. <laughs> I want to take this second to point out to you. I said it about four, maybe five shows ago. I think Lewis was about forty points ahead of George, and I said they're going to find a way. For George to overtake him in the constructors. You did say that. 
Here we are. Here we are. Georgia's ahead now by two points. Here we are. Here we are. I told you. I don't know how much of it is different car sabotage or how much of it is Lewis, I think, is losing his motivation and mojo. I think he's fed up. I think he's sick of it. And I just don't know that he's trying quite as hard as when he's on, he is on. I, I don't know part of it if he's really 100% on anymore. I think he's getting sick of all the nonsense. Well, we'll see. You saw in this race, his car was bouncing around a lot. And there's a side-by-side -side of George going around the same turn and then Lewis going by on the sand. And Lewis is fighting the car. And George is, like, smoothly making the turns, you know. And so yeah. my, I still – it's still confounding me, and I still get frustrated. If George is the lead driver now, if he is the future, why isn't he doing all the experiments? Why are they giving – Lewis, all these crappy cars to experiment with, and George gets the nice stable car. That's the question I have. They got me. I don't know. And don't know. it also points to I don't like how lately drivers who are going from team to team, or they're like Lewis has given so many years to Mercedes Benz. So many. And this is the way they want him to go out. Well, they wouldn't make him a brand ambassador either, but allegedly they offered it to Max to try to get him to come. <laughs> now, if you're now, that's a good that's a good point, Scott. Now, if you're Max Verstappen, are you going to Mercedes after you see this dumpster fire going on right now? I don't think Max is going to Mercedes anyway. I think if Max leaves, the more I think about it, mm -hmm. Max is not a corporate guy. To fit into Mercedes or Ferrari, have to be a company man. Okay. Or you have to be willing to sort of be a bit more of a company guy. Max is an iconic class. He is his own man. He does not take orders. He's independent. He's a rebel. What team on the grid would give him the ability to be who he is, other than Red Bull, to be that sort of independent, strong-willed, I'm going to do what I want, how I want, when I want, however I want. Right. There's one team on the grid that does that with multiple world champions. Who is it? Yeah, Red Bull. That's it. it. Or Aston Martin. You think Aston, but Aston Martin is a car company. <laughs> they are and they aren't. It's a little car company. They Fernando Alonso, I've been their guest, is treated like a king there. They treat him so well. They let him do what he wants. And they well, are now they bringing up. Aston Martin, what the heck? Into the gravel. What? what? Okay, wait. All right. Right here, it's paved. It's a new track. You can continue on that way and continue in the race. But he decided to go in the gravel, which will end his race. Did Lance Stroll tap out of this race? Did he know that he's just, it was wet and he just didn't want any more? I think he had a moment of brain fog and just wanted to get back to the race, saw, saw a straight line back to the race, didn't look down, and just said, I want to get back on the track, and just went. I believe George Russell did it too uh, two years ago in Brazil during Quali when he went off the track. And he beached his car, too, during the quality two years ago in Brazil. Same thing. They sort of forget sometimes where they are because the, your vision is so narrow with that mm -hmm. little slit of a helmet where you can barely see out of it. And I, I just think he sort of forgot that there was gravel underneath the car. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> and it's such and, a mistake. And then talking about our guy, Fernando Alonso, he was complaining about his back. He said the bouncing was so bad he had to not only had to be helped out of the car yes. and he literally said the only reason he finished that race was for the mechanics who did the work on the car. Having been again, a guest of their team three times and knowing his mechanics, I know his mechanics. I've spoken with his mechanics. I've spent a lot of time with his mechanics. Um, I believe him. He has a very close relationship with the guys in his garage with Mikey Brown and Matt Watson and Sam and Jimmy and he loves those guys. He, I mean, when he's podium, do you see how he gives them attention? 
He yeah. doesn't care about the crowd. He cares about his mechanics. And I actually do believe that. But look, the problem with Aston Martin isn't as much the drivers or the mechanics. It's Dan Fallows is not getting the job done. That car is a disaster. It's a disaster class. It is. It has gone nothing but backward um, ever since. You know, it was good for eight. It was good for half the year last season, and then it's just lost. Whatever ideas he took from Red Bull that knew he had, he has no idea how to update and build on them. Mm. And it's so just it's, when Newey comes in, is he gone? I I can't imagine that he survives unless he's good at implementing Newey's ideas. You know, unless Newey keeps them around because he's good at sort of being a number two. But his role, his days as a number one are obviously over. Um, he just hasn't been. I mean, their, their car development is embarrassing. Their car is terrible. It's, it's now, a, my guy, Yuki Sonoda and Yuki! Liam Lawson, they get double, double points this week. And they both looked Really good. I mean, Yuki, yeah. he qualified third, which is his highest qualifying ever in Formula One. And for a while, he was in third place for quite a while. Looked like if there wasn't going to be a safety car, which we all knew it was going to be, or, you know, a red flag or, or a VFC, that he might score on his first podium in Formula One. And I was rooting for him. You know I was. You know I was. You know, I was, Yuki, go Yuki. But. You know, Can I give you a term? The problem with VCAR is they've got Lauren Mackey's as team principal or whatever. That's basically the Ferrari of 2022 strategy is now there. He's the sporting director of Ferrari. They put him wet while everybody else still had the yeah. inners on. And they I was got like, the they got the bad strategy. The, I mean, look, Yuki started P, P3, Liam yeah. started P5. They race like hell, and they still, yeah, they finish respectively. I mean, they were P7. What were they, P7 and P9? No, they no. higher up. But I got to tell you, the, the Alpine boys said thank you very much. Um, you know, I mean, look, they still finished respectively. They did well. I mean, though, your P7 and P9 for a you know a midfield team is great. Um, they did great. Um, the drivers are great. And, you know, here you have Checo in the seat, once again, out of the points, started P12, finished P11. When are they going to end this madness? I don't know. I mean. I mean, it's it's mind-numbing. I And, and let, let me be clear to all of the fans from Mexico who love him. I'm an American. I have been calling for, I was calling for Logan Sargent's head during season one. Because yeah, 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 this isn't a national thing. Frankly, you want somebody from Mexico who I think would kick ass in Formula One? Pato Award, the fastest hand of IndyCar. Put him in Formula One. Yeah, yeah, I love to see it. Millions of Americans and Mexicans would watch. He's the most popular driver in IndyCar by a margin of about three to one. Everybody loves Pato. He's an amazing driver. Uh, he, by the way, he was very fast in FP1 in Mexico, by the way. He was 12th. By yeah, he had a, yeah, he had his test finally in uh, Mexico, great. right? He was great in FP1. Put Pato in. Like, it's not like, you know, I don't want a Mexican. Checo used to be awesome, but he's washed now. I mean, it's unfortunate. But It's still, sad to watch, too. It's sad because it, it happens so fast. Like, one minute, you're like, okay, Checo, in the beginning, remember he had a, a couple seconds. I think he had like two or three seconds in the first like seven races. And you're like, okay, Checo's going to have a good season. Then all of a sudden, bye-bye, Checo. Bye-bye. Sad. You know, and not, not only is it really sad, but you're, 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 let me, I th you, uh, mute it yourself. I'll un you unmute it. You have to. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I mean, it's in. sad to watch. I mean, you see Checo. Just, you know, Max is up here, and, and yeah. he's down here. And if they were a few positions apart, like Valtteri and Lewis were, where, you know, Lewis would be P1, Valtteri would be P3 or P4, you know, coming in Q3 every race, points every race. But this is this is like this. Max is here, and, you know, Checo is out of the points. You know, he has – he's one of the five most eliminated in Q1 in the sport, I believe. It's a joke. And, yeah, he's from Mexico. I know people from Mexico. A lot of them want a driver. Put Pato Award in F1. Pato Award is awesome. He would yeah. be incredible. Right. What do you 
in. All right. Moving on to Ferrari. Where's the Ferrari? All of them. Now, Carlos Sainz, great race, and then <clears throat> whatever this was, oh, crashing. Goodness. He looked bad. He looked really bad. And <laughs> that he's always saying that, and the fans are always saying, why isn't Carlos Sainz staying in the car? And I would say that this race is Exhibit 1A. Because this is why. Because the difference between the top drivers, Lewis Hamilton, uh, Max, consistency. And Carlos is a good driver. I wouldn't say he's a great driver. He's good. He win he's going to win some races a year if you got a good car. But he's not consistently going to win races. He's not consistently going to be. He's kind of like Lando in a way. They'll, they'll do all right. They'll do all right. But then there's lapses. There's lapses here. There's lapses there. And that's where Carlos is. I rate Carlos just on par with Lando. There's there are all those guys. There's like Carlos. There's Lando. I guess Alex Albon, but he's not as good. Um, you know, that, that type of driver where they're fast, but they're just not consistent. You know? And yeah. that's what Carlos is, I think. I rate him on like the George Russell kind of level. Yeah. They're both. Super fast, multiple race winner, mm -hmm. quite at the championship level thing. I think Lando's a touch flow. Lando has more race pace than Carlos. Yes. Carlos generally has a more level head, better strategy, much better strategy, much better race intelligence. Mm -hmm. than Lando, by far. Um, not quite as ultimately fast, but yeah, you know, Carlos, you know, has good races and not good races. Is he multiple world champion material? No. How many people on the grid are? Max? Uh, you know, Lewis certainly at his peak was. I don't, I don't know if he still is. Will will remains to be seen when he if Ferrari can give him a good car. If he if he'll be back at that level, we don't know. Um, Charles is excellent, but again, I you know haven't seen him in a championship car to see what he'll do. This has probably been his best season in F1. Uh, he's getting more and more consistent, fewer mistakes. Um, once he gets a championship car, we'll see. But there aren't that many top, top, top drivers at the top. There's, of the a, there's a good argument that Carlos, George, and Lando are all on the same tier. And it's kind of strange between all those three that Carlos has the most wins out of those three. You know? Yes, the most level and the most race intelligence, I think. Yeah. And but one thing I'll give George Russell in this, and I, you know, I'm not the biggest George Russell fan, but one thing I will say is after he made that pass, mm -hmm. he held the lead for quite a while. I mean, if it wasn't for he seems pretty hard, he's also so pretty hard to pass. He p positions his car in a way that makes it really tough for you to get by him. George is an excellent, he, George is an excellent starter. He's an excellent wheel-to-wheel -wheel battler. By the way, Oscar Piastri, same traits. Mm -hmm. and the, the, the issue with George is sometimes he bottles it under pressure, um, which is something, you know, that sort of, I view as George's Achilles heel. Um, you know, doesn't, hasn't shown quite the same consistency as a Max Verstappen or somebody like that. But he's, George is fast. George can win the race for you. George can get Paul. Um, you know, Carlos, you know, not quite as fast as, as George. But tons of race intelligence and will find a way to win if he can. But sometimes he has weekends where he's just off. You know, yeah. sometimes weekends where he's just on, where he's the fastest man on track. Sort of like Valtteri did when he was in a Mercedes. There are occasions when Lewis couldn't touch Valtteri. Yeah. yeah. Not usually, but sometimes. What happened with our young guns, Ollie Berman and our guy Franco Calipinto? What happened? This was not the weekend. What happened? what happened? This was not the weekend of the rookies. I mean, we had serious crashing, uh, certainly on Franco and and uh, unfortunately Williams Park. Um, Franco, you know, reminded us that he's still a, he's still quite inexperienced, and that he did come in at the middle of the season and without the kind of training that other rookies have had by this point in the season. And this was a tough race. This was brutal conditions. And both of those crashes for Williams cost a lot of money because those cars were done. Yeah, I mean, Franco totaled his car, unfortunately, in the race. And 
Albon really totaled his car at 180, 190 miles an hour in Q3. And Albon's, in all fairness, that one looked like a mechanical failure rather than a driver error. Did it look like brake brake failure? or Like something happened with the brakes or the brake sensors. Something looked like it happened when he hit the brakes. It looked like That didn't look like a mistake. Yeah, that didn't look like a mistake. Yeah. It, but it was a horrible crash. I was like, I, man. I mean, an hour. He was at the, the top speed on the straight. When he went to hit the brakes, they got to be over the cost cap. I mean, how many times? Because remember all the times Logan had put the car. They were the entering the weekend. They Williams was about five point five million, and you had yeah. multiple crashes in quality. You know, and then in the race, they mm-hmm. must they have two destroyed cars, and they were rebuilding the cars during they had big crashes during practices and quality. They must be. They must be over $10 million in damage. They, I don't see how they continue because the Concord Agreement requires them to go to races. Okay. In order to do that, I think they're going to have to start laying people off. They're going to have to start showing up to races without half their team. Because they don't, because because of the cough cap? That's yes. how much over the, you think there are? Oh, I, dude, they're not like a million dollars over. They're going to be many millions of dollars over. They probably did $5 million of damage this weekend. I'm not kidding. Do you think that yes. people who, teams that get into crashes, should that be excluded from the cost cap? No. Not if you have a cost cap. Why? No. Because, you know, accidents do happen. And why, why should the team suffer because you, we had an accident? That's wow, a wow. That's the consequences? Yeah. yeah. What if it's another... <laughs> What it like on, on, in this case? It's inclement weather, or here's another one: a blatant crash from another team. Somebody blatantly, you know, does something wrong. Should that count? Should there be like tiers of cost cap? Like, should you have degrees? Do you I, think? I don't think so. I mean, it's never been the thing in racing that you can pin your cost on somebody else. It's, that's that's just racing. It's the opposite of. That's it's just the bad, way it works. right? Yeah, it's hmm. the opposite the way it works on the road. Yep. Hmm. Um, but um, I just though my my heart does go out to them because their cars were not only crashed, they were like destroyed. Um, you know, and I really do believe they're looking at being not a little bit over, but multiple millions over, unless they have redundancies. I think they literally may have to idle 100 or 200 people at the factory for a month. That's, I would, that's insane. If, if that's they can. Can. Or, or, or could they just take the penalty in, you know, the wind tunnel time? Uh, they may have to do that and pay a me- me- mega fine, but the mega fine will come off probably their ability to spend for next year. So I, any way you look at it is an unmitigated disaster for them. Um, this was, this, this was literally the worst weekend they could have had. I mean, Man. it was, and you see the looks of people in their garage when it was. Oh, yeah. Them. Their hands were in their faces. They were just dejected. Yeah, one, was- the garage knew all the work they had to do. But two, I think the engineers knew how much money that was going to cost. They all knew what it meant because they were already, I think, at or near the cost cap with all of Logie Bear's crashes. And then I think Alex had a heavy crash too yeah. earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, he had a couple of heavy crashes or a big, big crash. And, you know, you just feel so bad for those folks because you know what they're, they're, they're going to be severe adverse consequences um, uh, because of it, in my opinion. Um, you know, one of the really cool things this weekend was the Senna, uh, Hamilton driving the Senna car. And that was awesome. <laughs> like they had the actual car that Senna drove and he was going around the track <laughs> and some some people say from the internet he was going faster in the the Senna car than he was in the actual Mercedes car around the track he was sending fa- fast laps in that it's car true, <laughs> he was quoted as saying that he would have preferred to race his own car than the Mercedes yes <laughs> That's how what a disaster. He even said that the 22 car was better than this car. And that was the car that was bouncing all around. That's what he said. He said the W13 made this car. He's like, the W13, hell, I could have won a championship in that car compared to this one. <laughs> I 
I was like, damn, this car is bad. That car is several seconds slower. That car is way slower per lap than the current car because yeah. the, they've increased the downforce so much because the, you know, the, the FIA has let him get away with a lot more dirty air than mm-hmm. the car years ago. But he and George, I think, have both said that this is the most unpredictable car they have. Well, as I had joked to you last time, the performance window of the W15 isn't a window, it's a slit. <laughs> <laughs> what a great tribute, though, I thought, this weekend. And you can see, if you didn't, they didn't broadcast it on the, the broadcast, but you can go on the internet and you can see the full lap of Lewis Hamilton or Sir Lewis Hamilton in Senna's uh, Reaper Honda car around the track. And you could see the whole celebration. I think it was there with, I think, Senna's daughter. And it just, it was just a nice. His sister touch. was it a sister? His sister. Okay, it was just a nice, nice touch. I thought it was very well done, and I like to see things like that. Now, what? Who are the losers and who are the winners from this weekend? You start okay. with your losers. Let's start with the losers first. The biggest loser has to be Lando Calrissian Norris. His championship bid, which I never saw as a bid for weeks, is over. He was exposed. He was exposed, I think, as not championship level quality. I mean, he just bottled it on the start, bottled it on the restart. He's just not there yet. I'm yeah, sorry. he went off a couple times, too, actually. Um, he was there. Two or three of, times. Yeah. yeah, I mean, other losers, clearly Williams. It was, I mean, they are in desperate straits right now financially because of the cost cap. I feel so bad for that team. Um, other losers, um, not nearly as big, but Ferrari's constructors bid fell by seven points. It was a, which isn't the worst, but you know, now they are, uh, they are now trailing uh, McLaren by seven more points. They're trailing them by uh, 36 points instead of 27. I do think they're going to recover a lot of points in Vegas because that is a Ferrari track. It's a power track that races just like Monza, but it was a rough weekend for them with Carlos not really performing in the race at all. Um, um, uh, you know, another one, frankly, is Oscar Piastri in the race. This is his third GP where he's just not really putting in the points. He's kind of anonymous, um, which is unfortunate. Another loser we have is Checo. I mean, he's just, you know, no points. He is wasting a seat, period. He is a waste of a seat. I'm sorry. I'm going to say my losers are, number one, definitely Checo. There comes a time when you got to look in yourself in the mirror. I know he has a contract. And he's probably just saying, fire me, because they probably have some incentives in there where he still gets paid a certain amount if they fire him instead of him retiring. Because we all thought he was going to retire after Mexico, but he didn't. At this point, he's probably just saying, if they're going to let me go, just fire me. I'll take the money, and I'll be on my way. I don't know if he's going to go to IndyCar or if he's going to another series or if he's just going to, you know, retire to Mexico and be with his family and, you know, maybe start coaching up the next generation of uh, little Checos around the track. That would be nice. Um, My other loser you said Williams. I'm going to say the team that keeps on giving last place, Sauber. Will they ever, ever, <clears throat> ever get out of last place? No. I mean, basically, Guang Yong Zhou, you basically could just say in 18th place or in 20th place. I mean, the poor guy can't ever get into the top 15 at least. It's sad to watch, and I feel bad for Valtteri because Valtteri's taken that dog of a car into P two, P three, qualifying quite quite a lot of times. But just race pace, it, there's no nothing to be found in that car, and I feel bad for Valtteri because I think he deserves better than what what's going on right now, and it's it's just awful to watch. It's looking like they're killing his career. It looks like I mean, all of the news reports, all of the. Rumors is Gabriel Bortoletto is going to be signed. That's been reported in motorsport. It's been reported in autosport that Salver Audi has signed Gabriel Bortoletto and Valtteri will be out. Bortoletto in, Valtteri out. Wow. Where, where, Valtteri, where do you think he'd go? Where do you think he's going to go? 
Well, the only spot, look, I think he should go to IndyCar. He's yeah. talking about hanging on as a reserve driver for Mercedes. I think that's a little insane. At his yeah. age, ain't no one bringing him back. Yeah, why would you do that? I would go to IndyCar. He'll make millions of dollars. He'll be popular. And he'll probably kick ass there, by the way. He's a good driver. He's a good driver, yeah. I right. love Smoltry. And he could go with McLaren. And they can take Palto and bring him up to the big team. And I'd love to see Valtteri and IndyCar. I'd love to go out to Sonoma and see Valtteri with the, you know, the mop top hair and everything. I'd love to see Funny, that. funny you should say Sonoma. Uh, next, next, uh, the week after next, I'll be driving Sonoma for two days in the pro course at the AMG Driving Academy. <laughs> yeah, I'll be out there. I'll be out there to support you. And for your winners of the weekend, who do you have? Simply lovely. Max Verstappen, I'm sorry. The great race. Unbelievable balance as well. Uh-huh. <laughs> Simply lovely. Look, I, and I, I think Max Verstappen belongs in among the top rung of people who've ever driven in the sport. Right up there with Lewis. Ever driven? And settled. Yeah. Really? 19 wins in a season. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Oh, that, that fake Not that, like, the, the bib and the the break duck and uh, you know, come on, come on. I think it's always, that, it's always that, something. I think you know, setting aside whatever the drama is at Red Bull, mm. or driving talent that man has. Nicky Lauda summarized it best when he saw him drive as a teenager in F one. He called him the driving talent of the century. I think Nicky Lauda is objective. He put Lewis in Mercedes to create a dynasty. Yeah. He was right. Yeah, I love Vicky. Yeah. I think he was so right. You're, you're putting him up there with, with Schumacher, Senna, and Hamilton now, huh? He, he's Is he better than Prost now? Yes. Would you say he's better than Prost? Yeah. Would you yeah. say he is – is he better than Nicky? Yes. He's faster. Uh, let's see. Who else Who else is in my top, top up there? What about Vettel? Is he better than Vettel? Oh, without question. Without question. Vettel was good with one kind of car, but yeah. Uh, what about who? Who else would be my top top? That's pretty much he. If my my guys are Hamilton, Schumacher, Senna, or, or my top three. Who's all that wrong? Wait, say that again. Juan Manuel Fangio, five world championships. Yeah, but I, I don't. That's so far and long ago. I usually don't. He blew everybody away. Yeah, blew, at, yeah, he did. Even at age forty six. Yeah. He, he was the Max Verstappen, the Lewis Hamilton, the Schumacher of his time. Of his era, yeah. He was All right. So, Max is your winner. Who else do you have winning? This uh, Esteban Ocon. I think Ocon, I've always said, is a great driver who's never had the chance to show it. I firmly believe that. Just not teammate friendly. No, 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 no. <laughs> um, I don't think Max is teammate friendly, by the way. You don't want to be his teammate. Yeah, he's he really um, in his championships. He hasn't had anybody really to to, to uh, he hasn't had a a teammate that's challenged him. You know, I, that's why I'd love to see. You know, they say the rumor is they you know Christian Horner was in the the going to see Carlos Sainz and maybe sign him. And we talked about that last week. And I said that and we both said if. Red Bull will listen to us, and they should. They would go sign Carlos Sainz and bring him back to the team. And I heard that Josh didn't want that. Josh Verstappen had part of his contract said he didn't want Carlos coming back to the team at all because they were teammates before. And I think Carlos did give Max a run for his money. I thought he beat him, didn't he? He did not beat him. He was he was still a step slower than him, but he was among the closest teammates Max ever had. Yeah, and that's and I, Red Bull. He's probably not going to beat Max. But he's going to be closer than certainly any of Max's current teammates. Right. And I think that would be the best thing for them to do, actually. But then the other rumor was that they were going to go and try to get Franco Calapinto. And I couldn't see Williams letting him go to Red Bull without a big, huge payday. That's a $20 million, $30 million. That's at least yeah. a $20 million payday. But like soccer transfer money, you know. <laughs> Williams not letting him go so easily. I don't think so. So my winners are going to be, obviously, Max, you've already covered. I'm not going to even talk about that. I'm just going to say Alpine because 
I always love the underdog, and I'm a big Pierre Gasly fan. Actually, I love Pierre Gasly. I think he's very underrated, and I do think I agree with you. Esteban Ocon is really good too. He just doesn't, you know, he's just a little prickly as far as his teammates. But if you put that aside, and you gave the guy a good car, he's fast over one lap. He's quick, and I think he has a good talent on track. He just has never been able to show it consistently because he's never had a consistent car. So my shout is to the Alpine racing team that was Renault that's getting rid of the Renault engine and supposedly going to Mercedes power. That's going to be something, I think. I think that's going to be great for them. They have a decent aero department. So I think they're going to be very competitive with the Mercedes engine. <laughs> They have a their own department. Their upgrades usually work when they when they actually upgrade the car. I think yeah, they're going to remember where Alpine was in the beginning of the season. I mean, it's a tanker, right? I mean, they were like what 30, 40 kilos overweight. I mean, it could it was heavy. It was just always in the back, and to be from where they were to be where they are now. And I'm sure when they go back to Vegas, they'll be back to you know. You know, Gasly maybe getting P10 or maybe P11. You know, yep. I'm not sure that'll happen. But they had their day in the sun. But I do think RB is going to pass them up because I think that car's faster. By the way, there's one more winner I think that you should add. I think it's your favorite driver for one of them. Of course it is. Yuki! And I, I think I'm going to, Yuki, we're going to turn Yuki's smile. See, I got, I got the, the sad. This is sad, Yuki. Yeah, he's sad some of times. But he's not sad anymore because that was one hell of a drive by Yuki Sonoda. He would you have know? finished higher than P seven, but for this, but for the lousy strategy. Yeah, yeah I mean, <clears throat> it, put, it put them both on the wet tire. Everybody else was on inners, mm -hmm. and then the red flag. So the Luckily, that happened because then they get to change the tires again. But I was like, why don't they split the strategy, leave one guy out, and bring the other guy in? I don't so, – all right. Let's end the show with this. It used to be the midfield teams would always split strategy. One guy would take one strategy, like plan A. The other guy would take plan B. And whatever we can do to score the most points, it's going to happen that way. A lot of the times now. Both drivers are on the same strategy, and I don't know where these strategists are getting this from. I don't know if they've gone into some secret algorithm that says they should do this, but it's stupid. You know why they do it? Why? Because the person who ends up on the short end where their strategy turns out to be bad, that driver is pissed off and their manager is pissed off. It's you know what? And it's political, but you know what I tell them? I do the Ferrari answer. We're trying to score the most points we can for the team. And so the team is the one that pays you. And if we both are out of the points, mm -hmm. then we're not happy. So if we get one guy in the points, we're a midfield team. If we get one guy in the points and one guy's out of the points because of the strategy, I'm happy. Ferrari is right. Ferrari. And, and if, you if you don't like it, kick rocks and go to F, you know, IndyCar or uh, WC. That's what I tell them. And you know what? That is very much Ferrari. It's like I spoke to one of the Ferrari team members about Carlos leaving, and they said they all love him and they're sad. But that's racing. The that's, team that's is more racing. important. The team that up Ferrari is more important than any single individual. And at Ferrari, they would do that. They would split the strategy, and you would just have to accept it. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. If you're a, yep. a midfield team, if they would have done that. Yuki would have stayed out. He would have had track position. Max would have passed him. We all know that. But he oh. got second. Yeah. Because he yeah. was running third. And That's maybe Ocon, maybe Ocon. I don't think Ocon would have passed him only because the RB is a faster car. But yes, let's yes. just say Ocon has better racecraft and he would have passed him. Okay. Okay. He's still third. He's still on the podium. Why not split the strategy? Stop going on the same strategy if you're in the midfield. Yeah. My rant is over. Yes. You're right. <laughs> well, final words there, Scott? 
Uh, we've got Vegas coming up in three weeks, I think, or something like that. Um, yeah. Big power track. Engine means everything in Vegas. Look for the Alpines to be in the very back. You need horsepower in Vegas. Last I year. love Vegas last year. We can't go this year because of some other engagements that the family has. And I'm really disappointed because I actually had a good time at that race, even though the first day was a disaster. First day of practice was a disaster. Oh, but other than that, the weekend was great. And I wanted to go back. But we're there too. We were with Williams in the Paddock Club. Mm -hmm. uh, Talking with the among people, like, oh, oh, there's Mr. Savage, the chairman, about his strategy for the team. Uh, <laughs> I just, this way, on a personal level, I feel so bad for those people. They are so nice. They're so good to their guests. And they care so deeply about the team and the sport and mm -hmm. getting ahead and really making a go of it. And I just, I know those people, and I feel so bad about what happened on the weekend for them. Well, I mean, like, well, if that's <laughs> racing. You can't control that. I mean, it was the conditions were really harsh. You got a rookie driver, and then you probably had some type of mechanical issue with with the other crash. I mean, it's bad luck, but you know, like, like we always say, it's keep on racing, right? Keep just keep on racing. Keep your head down and keep going. That's all you can do. So thanks everybody for joining us on our 2024 Brazilian Grand Prix recap review show. We're happy that Scott's finished with his long day of work today. He's looking very tired. He's probably going to go take a nap or probably go to bed. But for all of you to men in from wherever you are, keep on racing everybody. We would be honored if you would join us. Ladies and gentlemen, can I please have your attention? I've just been handed an urgent and horrifying news story. And I need all of you to stop what you're doing.